Hello, everyone. Are you tired of spending your valuable time setting up operational tasks? Well, if you are, this is the video for you. We are joined by Dean Wells, Principal PM Manager for AutoManage, and we'll get right into it. Hey, hey Peter, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Very good. Thank you. So... Azure Auto Manage, we announced this in, at uh, Ignite 2020. We did um, indeed, yes. Is it, uh, what is, tell us about it. What is it for the, those who, of us who don't know and uh, why, especially why did we come up with that? Okay, yeah. So we announced it at uh, the tail end of 2020 in the last Ignite there in public preview. Uh, we're still in public preview for the Auto Manage VM best practices offering for uh, Windows, but we also announced the preview of Auto Manage VM best practices for Linux. So now that same service, which is currently the main functionality of Auto Manage, is now available regardless of whether you're running Windows or Linux, and the user experience is identical. So to put a pin in that and then answer your original question, where did this come from? So about it took some time to get to this point. About three years ago, by pure chance, at Ignite, uh, my current manager, who back then was uh, in a different team to me, we knew each other very well. We've been friends for a long time. He suggested that he had an idea and he would find it useful for me to go and interview some people while I was at Ignite doing shielded virtual machine and virtualization security stuff. Yep. So I said, great, what's your idea? And he said, I want to see if we can build some clever technology in Azure that eliminates the need for people to perform these mundane, repetitive, day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month tasks, where because it's so mundane and repetitive, it often introduces human error. I'm like, okay, give me a few examples. So he said, well, pretty much any management tool in Azure, I want to be able to automate it if the machine is healthy. So if it's in a steady state, well, because it's Windows, we know that extremely well, and we can even measure whether it's in a steady state. If it is, and given that in the first place we built Windows, we know Windows so well, why can't we automate those daily operations completely? If it's in an unknown state where it's broken, let's not try and fix that, because we all know that the, man, uh, the number of broken permutations is very, very large. So uh, the basics of the service is, if there's a management service in Azure that typically a customer needs to discover, onboard to, configure, monitor, and then remediate all, there was my camera, there it is, all five of those things, they have to do that manually, which requires a browser or some scripts that they've written in PowerShell or Azure CLI or even leveraging our own APIs or ARM templates. But nonetheless, it's still human beings doing the job. Yep. What we wanted to do was see if we could build technologies where with point, click, done, simplicity, all of those things are taken care of for you or taken care of for you rather, including the discovery piece, which means now you don't have to know what services there are in Azure. Then the onboarding, now you don't need to know how to onboard to that service. Then the configuration and making sure it's aligned with that service's best practices. Now you don't need to know how to configure it per best practices. And then I think the biggest piece, because those first three, you only do those once, right? You discover, you onboard, you configure, and then hopefully it's doing everything it should be. But the biggest piece where it becomes repetitive and human labor intensive is monitoring that the service is still working in the way that you expect it to on that virtual machine. And then if it isn't, remediating it. We do all five. So the first three, we do that uh, by the time we get to general availability, we will be onboarding, configuring, monitoring and remediating. And obviously the discovery piece is kind of a requirement. 15 services for Windows and 14 for Linux. Ultimately, it will become 15 for Linux as well, but one of the services right now doesn't support uh, the Linux SKUs that we need. Okay. So uh, the basic goal of the service is take what today is a very manual point click, know about that. How do I back up in Azure? Ooh, let me search for backup in the uh, Azure portal. Oh, there's something called Azure Backup. Let's go and see what that does. Spend an hour reading up on how to, how it works and what the fees that it incurs are and all those things. Then configure it so that it meets your grandfather, father, son backup strategy or whatever it is you do. And then from that point forward, you've got to keep monitoring it to make sure it did actually take a backup. Once that's done, now if it didn't take a backup, now you're the one on the hook to go and remediate it. We take over all of that work for the entire life cycle of a VM, starting from 
It probably supports Windows Server 2008 R2 in terms of raw technical functionality. I would expect it to work, but uh, that's really uh, a very old operating system. So we start with Server 2012, and then we work with most of the commonplace distros, such as RHEL and SUSE and SLES and all of the others. And uh, I've, I've got all of that information for those of you that are interested in knowing about it, uh, which we can provide where, Pierre. How would we get... Oh, I know. You could simply browse to aka dot ms forward slash also manage and that would give you all of the details in terms of the uh, the linux distros we support yeah and all of the links that we're talking about today and all of the references will be uh somewhere at the bottom of the screen as we talk about it and Fabulous. in the associated blog post as a next step and resources for you to um to see yeah um I have a quick question because you mentioned that the, like for log analytics and onboarding for uh, performance monitoring, uh, that's all part of uh, AutoManage. Is this using the uh, current set of agents or are we leveraging the uh, Azure monitor agent with the data collection rules that is currently also in preview? So we're not planning on rebuilding anything. So right now we're built on top of the existing Azure agent and the extensions therein. Uh, once a new agent, we're going to switch over to that as gracefully as we can. Uh, and obviously we've got some technology planned to make that transition, hopefully transparent. But obviously we've not built that yet, hence I'm going to say hopefully and cross my fingers. So uh, yeah, we don't actually do anything uh, unique on the virtual machine. We don't need to install another agent. We don't even need to install another extension. All we're doing is pulling Pinocchio's strings in the cloud based on the existing agent and extensions that are there. And if there's a new extension needed for say, Azure Backup or Security Center or any of the other services that we onboard you to, that gets taken care of so you don't have to worry about it again. Okay, oh, so that's perfect. Uh, and when you mentioned onboarding, uh, currently it's only during the preview, it's only through the portal, correct? Close. The portal is the primary experience because we wanted people to learn the extent of the product's capabilities. Because if you think about it, do people prefer to go to a user experience, walk their way through it and learn, or do they go and want to want to go and read a three-page white paper? Uh, typically, it's the former. I know I'm certainly in the former category. I would far rather go to a portal, figure out everything it does there. And then if I'm like, well, maybe I'll read the white paper because this is actually of interest, I will typically do that second. So we built the portal experience and we threw a great deal of effort in making sure it was point, click, set, forget. That was uh, an important goal for us. Uh, that's done, that is now available, but you can also onboard using ARM templates. So you can just do native onboarding there and you can do uh, Azure policy. So we have a, a preview of a built-in Azure policy that allows you to scope a policy to some number of thousands of VMs or whatever. Uh, obviously, that scoping criteria is extremely rich. And you then, in that Azure policy, simply choose one of the two config profiles that we offer. One is called production. You can probably guess what that's for. And cleverly, the other one's called dev test, which is not production. So that's why we have two. And the two different profiles basically offer different services. For example, Azure Backup good for production, but can incur a cost because you're storing backups. Dev test machines probably don't need to be backed up. So that's the reason for those uh, the, the existence of two config profiles. Basically, it allows us to ask one question as opposed to 17, from which we infer the rest. So the portal experience is there, Azure policy is there, and ARM templates are there. By the time we get into GA, hopefully in the next few months, which would be toward the third calendar quarter of this year, there will be Python, Go, PowerShell, and Azure CLI in addition to those. And of course, uh, again, native ARM template ingestion and all of those good things. Okay, that's that's wonderful. Uh, you did mention the, um, the produ uh, production and dev test uh, profiles. Yeah. Uh, I've had some questions from the community. Uh, one is, can those profiles be modified? So for example, uh, in a dev test environment, yes, those machines are not going to live for very long, so I don't need to have them backed up, but I may need to have them uh, VM insight and log analytics and performance counters uh, collected so that I can see that the application that we're building is not creating a bottleneck uh, on that VM, so I need to get that. Can I modify the, those dev test uh, profiles? So we get this question in various forms quite a lot. 
So right now, these profiles and at release, they are going to be technical development engineer terminology. They're immutable and read only. So from the customer standpoint for you guys, they are not something you can edit. Okay. So does that mean that that's all that you can do with the VM? No, you can augment it. So if whether it's dev test or production, if we don't onboard you to a service that you want, you can go and onboard and discover and configure it manually. We won't consider that as deviation from the config profile. If, however, you try to offboard from a service that is in our config profile, now you're contradicting what is measured as conformance to that profile. We will consider that to be drift, i.e. you've drifted from the configuration, at which point kicking and screaming or politely, we don't care which, you're going to be dragged back into conformance with the profile. Whether you like it or not. We heard repeatedly was... I'm down with 12 of the 15 that you're going to release, but I cannot do, I'll give you a few candidates that come up, uh, Azure Backup because we've been in using Symantec or some other backup tool forever and a day, and we've got it so well set up, I, I don't want to change that. Uh, the other one that we get a lot was Azure IaaS Anti-Malware. People love the service, they love what it does, but again, they've been using Trend Micro or Norton or whatever it is they've been using, again, forever and a day. So what we did is we started adding things that we call preferences, config profile preferences, that allow you to turn off some of those services or to tweak their configuration one way or the other, still conforming to best practices, but you might actually say for Azure Backup, wanted to back up more frequently than we configured it. That is not drift. That's still conforming to the best practices. So we will allow you to do that. If you tried to offboard from Azure Backup and it was a production profile, not allowed. We're going to drag you straight back in and backup's going to continue. If you onboarded to Azure Backup for a machine with the dev test profile, that's fine. We don't consider that as drift because you manually did something in addition. You didn't change what you you told us the machine was supposed to look like because we only focus on the pieces we configure. So you can add to them, and in some services, you can switch them off or tweak their configuration slightly, but you cannot challenge what the service list looks like or what the definition of best practices is at the lower and upper bounds of some setting relative to that service. Okay, so basically your profile becomes your minimum bar. Yep. So, and if it drops below minimum bar, we fix it. If it if you add stuff on top of it, we don't care about it. You got it precisely. Okay. And one of the things that we've also been asked is, can I create my own configuration profiles? That was going to so, be my next question. Yeah, I figured you might ask that next. And it really is the uh, the sad thing to say when we do these videos. Good question, but that is a genuinely good question, and I get it all the time. Um, we are looking into that. So I won't commit to that. And for those of you that have seen these videos with Pierre and myself before, well, we don't like to commit to things that we haven't yet built. Well, we haven't yet built that. But we are looking into refactoring our API. And Pierre, is there any way that folks that watch this can give us any feedback? Is there a Absolutely. A there is? OK, Absolutely. well, then I'll, I'll ask for some feedback here. And Pierre will tell you how we get that feedback in a second. It'll be listed below in the uh, in in the screen and in the description of this video. Brilliant. Okay, so if any of you would like to cast an opinion, we have production and dev test profiles. I already said they are immutable, meaning they're read only. You can't touch them. You can add to what they do, as Pierre coined it. They basically define the minimum bar configuration for a virtual machine. You can add to that by onboarding something to another service that we don't touch, but you can't argue with us because we consider any argument as drift and we fix it. One exception to that is obviously if you're going to the lower or upper bounds or you increase backup frequency to use that example again, that's permissible. But the thing we can, we're getting frequently is can I do my own? So we're actually refactoring our API now that we've got uh, a couple of thousand auto managed machines already up and running and we've got a huge amount of data from the way people are using them. So the entire API is being refactored. We're refactoring it in a way where for want of a better phrase, you could call it desired state configuration for Azure, which if you think about what we just discussed, Pierre, the config profiles, yep. they're kind of like DSC for Azure, where you've got actual DSC inside Windows and Linux guest operating systems, where you define a profile, you decide define an end state. And if it's not that, DSC makes it do that. Config yep. profiles kind of do that already. So they are almost already DSC for Azure. 
I think that's probably a crap name, in my opinion, but it is extremely self-explanatory. So we're refactoring the API to really give us the same level of flexibility that DSC has in Windows and Linux across the gamut of services that Azure offers. Given that we're building that, it does seem very logical to conclude that we would allow you to define a config profile of your own, save it as a given name, and then push it out via an Azure policy to 10,000 VMs. That seems very likely. So I can't commit to doing that because we don't have it on my backlog yet. Uh, I don't have a dev team assigned to do that yet. But as you can tell from the length and the amount of thought that's gone into my answer, we've given this a great deal of thought and we've surveyed lots of customers and they all love the idea. So uh, if any of you have got feedback to give, uh, there will be a link in the bottom down there somewhere. Look at me doing the YouTube stuff. It's there. That's my foot. No, it's not. It's a link to the actual page. <laughs> so I have no idea what Pierre is going to do there, but uh, yes, get me some feedback. And even if you wanted to email me directly, I'm open for that as well. My email address, are you ready for this, is dean at microsoft.com because I'm that important. Just Dean. No, it's just not very Dean. Important. You're I like, like Madonna or, 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 or... I added myself as a member. So that's really all it is. But uh, it's kind of cool when you can say Dean at Microsoft. Okay, you should do it, Pierre. Yeah, Pierre like, at Microsoft.com. It's like Madonna or Prince. Like exactly. It's, like it's that. You're at the, the, the top of your game. Yeah. Tafcad, the artist formerly known as Dean. There you go. <laughs> Actually, uh, I had another question here. Is, uh, is this going to replace DSC? Uh, no, so funnily enough, the one of the services we onboard you to is called, or is actually under the covers, DSC, guest configuration. Yeah. We already do that, and we push down the baseline profile. So what that basically means is when you onboard, say, Windows Server 2016, every time we release an OS, there's a team that's under the Windows banner, and then there's a team under the Azure banner. They get together, and we produce what we think is the optimal DSC profile for that operating system. We automatically implement that. So we're already doing DSC in the guest. So it's not replacing it. It's using it. And then the discussion we just had, Pierre, was does DSC for Azure exist? It kind of does in the form of ARM templates. And then there's yeah. this preview of something called Bicep that's out there right now. We're trying to say we're going to make that even easier and build something potentially that's built on top of that API I mentioned earlier on that truly does do exactly what DSC for guest operating systems does. It's it's so very popular. I'm very, very optimistic that we will build it. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic that we won't call it DSC for Azure. <laughs> but, uh, it is a good ex explanatory term. But yeah, I definitely wouldn't want to have that as its brand. Just wait till the marketing people get their hands onto it and, and it will be DSC for Azure version one enterprise. You know, the branding I try not to get too involved in because people have got far stronger opinions than I often do. Auto Managed was, uh, you know, a brand that uh, my colleague who actually came up with the idea, the, the person that uh, I did the surveys for Aboriginal Ignite back in 2018, I think it was, he came up with the brand Auto Managed and I told him I thought that was horrible literally the worst brand I'd ever heard. So then he's like, well, come up with something better then when I joined the team to take it over and drive the project for him. Uh, two and a half years later, I've come up with nothing better. So auto manage it is. So oh, like it or not, that's the brand. Okay. Uh, moving on, the profiles you mentioned. So we've got the production, we've got the uh, dev test. Can they be split or scheduled? So if you've got an HA uh, environment where you've got like a failover environment or a distributed environment, can you apply those changes? Like when you do your rem remediation, can they be staged across so right your Right now, no. I understand the question. So you're, you're, you're thinking, or the person who asked it is thinking along the lines of like maintenance windows that would be used for patching. We currently don't intersect with any maintenance window. So if you drift, we'll detect it within six hours, which is our poll cycle, when we go back in and we say, are you the cell? Oh, yes, you're all good, ignore you. Go to the next one, you're all good, we'll ignore you. Oh, you're not all good, you're no longer doing backup in your uh, production machine, fix you. That will happen within six hours, whether you want it to or not. In terms of onboarding, if you wanted to onboard just to make sure things didn't go awry, you could obviously craft up an Azure policy to scope out a set of machines that make sense to you, onboard those, test them, and if they appear to be working 24 hours, 48 hours later, then go and do other batches by using Azure policy scoping criteria. 
It's not so much about the onboarding is the ongoing. So once exactly. all those machines are onboarded, six months from now, a patch comes down and auto manage, uh, well, auto manage deploys. Actually, it doesn't deploy the patch currently. Correct. Right, we don't deploy patches. So again, if you think about uh, the services that already exist in Azure, update management already exists. So yes. we're not going to replace the update management stack, which funnily enough, doesn't actually replace the Windows update stack. It orchestrates it, pulls Pinocchio strings again, the same uh, analogy I used earlier on. Uh, we make that easier by pulling Azure update management strings for you. So now we've got, we're pulling its strings, it's pulling Windows update and Linux update mechanisms. It's pulling those uh, operating system strings and ultimately you get patched. However, with update management, it's difficult for us to know what the configuration should look like. So for the moment, we onboard you to it and we begin auditing your conformance with the current set of, of patches specific to, and obviously available and released, the operating system that we're looking at. And we'll tell you when it is not patch conformant, but we will not schedule the patches yet. That's one of the very few areas where there is one addi additional management task, set up that maintenance schedule because whatever we pick, it's going to be wrong for, for somebody. The majority. I would, I would guess that's the reason why we do it this way. So that is one of the few, if not the only things that would require a follow-up action with regard to, I've just onboarded to the config uh, profile production. Is there anything else I need to do? Well, there is. If you want to do uh, Azure Update Management patching, you need to go and add a schedule. Okay. Other than that, no, I can't think of anything else uh, off the top of my head. So this, you've just answered, uh, I think, three of the other questions that I've had from the from the community, uh, meaning no, it's not going to uh, replace uh, patch management because you're yeah. you're, re you're really uh, uh, auto manage is kind of like an it's mostly an orchestrator to onboard existing services and ensure that they're present and running properly exactly. on your target. Simplification is the VM best practices focus, but keep in mind, I think this is a good place to tee it up here, is also manage is going to become an umbrella brand, meaning we also manage this and that and this and that, and all different permutations. We've got a lot of things already in there. VMs was our primary candidate because they're so pervasive, they're everywhere. Yeah. Even with people marching to the cloud as fast as many of them can, they've still got gobs, millions of VMs running in Azure. Yeah. That's why we built it first, because it's one of the areas where we can make the biggest impact uh, and do so in a timely manner. There are other services coming down the pike. For example, we plan on adding premium services. So I'll give you an, a hypothetical. I've spoken to the team that will do this, but this is still hypothetical because there's no code to back it, not even a prototype. Uh, that team would be Azure Backup. So I asked a lot of customers, when you take a backup, whether you use an on-prem tool or Azure Backup, what's your schedule? What's your backup strategy? And they all say, oh, we have a grandfather, father, son backup schedule where we back up once a day, and then it gets archived off, persisted for six months, and then eventually gets deleted. Something along those lines. One team, uh, an, an MSP, a managed service provider, coincidentally, the towboat team inside of Microsoft, said, we don't have a backup strategy. I'm like, what do you mean you don't have a backup strategy? You're a managed service provider. Your customers must think you're useless. He says, no, 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 you misunderstand. We have a restore strategy. Backup is a prerequisite. I'm like, oh, that's good. I'm going to steal that phrase as though I made it up. <laughs> a restore strategy is when they take a backup, they don't consider that as success. They clone the VM somewhere in a little sandbox, isolated, and they restore the backup. If it works, they go, right, that backup's good. If it doesn't work, they delete it and try and figure out why. That's the way people should be working with backup technologies. So now imagine we bring auto manage into the picture. We want to start adding icing on the cake features to services that already exist in Azure that you get when you're auto managed. And these will obviously not be free. Uh, so I guess that's a good point to say right now. VM best practices is free in preview, and it will be free when it's generally available. We have no plans to build for it. So there's no fee for the, all of this uh, discovery, onboarding, configuration, monitoring, remediation. However, some of the services we onboard you to may incur fees like Azure Backup, for example. So keep that one in mind. These premium features that we're discussing now, we will probably bill incremental fees for those specific to a collection of icing on the cake features yeah that we will ultimately build. But again, I do want to emphasize, this is pure hypothetical right now. 
I have a spec for it. I've spoken to the team that owns it. They love the idea. Customers that I've spoken to love the idea, but do not treat what I've just said as a commitment or a time frame because we haven't even written line one yet. So no, we're nowhere near there, but those are sort of some of the loftier goals that we've got under the Auto Manage for VMs banner. And the other thing that we're doing that is imminent, we do have uh, a prototype for that is, it's funny because we were just talking about this, patch orchestration. So Azure Update Management orchestrates Windows Update patching stack, the software in the operating system. We orchestrate Azure Update Management to do the right thing, but without a schedule. Ultimately, what's missing in the market today, and again, this is not a feature we've built yet. This is uh, one that's highly specced and has been prototyped. The way patching works today is the VMs get treated as individual VMs. There are things like scale sets that you can put in place in Azure, but even a scale set doesn't fully define, say, uh, an N-tier application where there are four tiers with 10 VMs apiece. There's a front-end web tier, load balanced. There's a compute and database tier at the third layer. There's some business logic mapping maybe in the third layer and maybe identity, domain controllers, Active Directory in the back tier. There's nothing really to allow you to define that exact application, what the minimum bar requirements are to keep the whole thing up and running whilst you're patching it. Nobody's built that yet. That's what we plan to build. So additional layers of orchestration. That would be another icing on the cake feature, just like restore validation would be for Azure Backup. But again, I do need to re-emphasize re this. Sorry for saying it so frequently. This is not a commitment and there is no time frame. but I'm pretty darn confident we're going to build patch orchestration soon. And soon is it's uh, almost April 1st. Well, this is not an April Fool's joke. We do plan on doing that imminently. But the other stuff and even this one, the timeline is uh, still up in the air. We don't know when yet. We're not quite done with VM best practices. This is when I, I, I press the, the pause button next to your head and insert the uh, disclaimer. <laughs> Where is at, it? Uh, what, there, there it is. <laughs> yeah, it's right there, the pause button there. And, That's and the say, light switch, folks, but uh, it does <laughs> the pause button, doesn't it? I just... Yeah, and then the, yeah, and the, the, op, the, the opinions uh, expressed in this podcast uh, may not be reflected by Microsoft Corporation. Resume. Okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, actually, that kind of ties into what we talked about earlier about HA and having multiple uh, or scheduled for. Yeah. So that's that's good. Um, one more thing in terms of what we can support. Uh, what about hybrid? Is there a hybrid play? Like, what about an Azure Arc uh, managed server or even uh, VMs that are running in in HCI uh, locally? Okay. So with regard to Azure Arc and Auto Manage, this is definitely something that we're asked very frequently. It's probably the second most frequently asked question we get, second only to can I edit your config profiles or create my own. Intersecting with Azure Arc is probably ahead of that sometimes and other times it's just beneath it. So very, very popular question. So much so that uh, a colleague of mine, we're actually on the same team, Azure Arc and Auto Manage are owned in the same team. Uh, Ryan, he owns that. He and I spoke about it extensively, and then we went and prototyped it. And lo and behold, it worked. Not quite sure when that's going to go out the door, but we're prototyping it both for Windows and for Linux. So once we've got that done, again, timeframe's unclear at this particular point, but the prototype was extremely successful. Only one service failed, and I won't even mention what that is right now, because obviously that's just down to us to fix it. Yeah. Uh, that is going to be an extremely popular product, in my opinion. Plus, as we've uh, sort of alluded to, it's kind of a captive audience for us. People that are using Azure Arc for server want Azure management tools to manage stuff that's not in Azure. The goal of Auto Manage VM best practices is to eliminate the need for you to know about the management tool, onboard to it, configure it, monitor it, and remediate it. Now, how did I make six out of five things? I cannot count. Uh, <laughs> sorry, five things that we do there. But uh, yes, that is extremely popular, very commonplace question, and absolutely on uh, what I would consider to be an imminent roadmap. Okay. All right. So that makes absolute sense. Uh, and I'm glad to uh, see that it's it on the roadmap, uh, which was the next question on my list from the community is, um, what else is on the roadmap? Okay. So that's a, a lofty one. So I mentioned earlier on that Auto Manage will become an umbrella brand. Yeah. Right now, the focus, and it's a laser focus on virtual machines. Yes. Later down the road, we might, for example, take other services 
and we'll answer this aspect of it first. Other high value services, the customers say love this service, like they love using VMs in Azure, uh, Azure Kubernetes service. Customers are using that so much now, it took off like nobody's business. Uh, they tell us though, it's quite hard to administer and configure and yep. maintain. Okay, let's also manage that then. So that's one of the off on a different path services under the auto managed umbrella that we may well do at some point in the future. But uh, the VM space itself is so deep, I'm going to need to triple my dev team to be able to take on the likes of AKS whilst still working on the VM pieces. So getting back to uh, the more imminent roadmap stuff, we mentioned some of the icing on the cake features like mm -hmm. uh, backup restore validation. That would be one. Another yeah. one would be patch orchestration, which I'm hoping to build imminently. And I mean, really imminently, that's what we're looking at. Other features that we're looking at are AI ops based. Uh, and some of the technology that you're already seeing in AutoManage is actually backed by AI running in Azure. One of the things that we're going to be leveraging is resource exhaustion forecasting machine learning algorithms that will be, and we've already prototyped this, so this actually exists, uh, properly prototyped, and partially Azureified in terms of it runs as part of the way that the Azure fabric runs. It just doesn't have an experience yet, so you can't turn it on, you can't turn it off, you can't see what it predicted or anything. But this is going to come down the pike at some point in the future. Resource exhaustion forecasting will basically monitor the core compute resources, CPU, memory, disk, and network. And it will look for patterns over time. Uh, and if it sees a pattern of CPU usage growth, when that hits some prediction point where it will say, I've got three months of data, I can make a prediction 30% of the data sample size, so basically one month out, it's going to make a prediction based on that three month trend and say, oh crap, you're literally going to be at CPU 99% pegged eternally. Yep. Therefore, it will make a recommendation to upsize the VM. Isn't there something already in uh, the Windows Admin Center where it does that predictive analysis? Yeah, so the, the machine learning algorithm is actually based on System Insights, which is part of Windows Server 2019, and obviously Windows Server 2022, I think it is going forward. Um, I think that's right, I'm not sure if that's the correct name, but uh, somewhere around that. Yes, that is literally the product. So we, uh, we asked them for their code base, and then we morphed it or refactored it to work in Azure, which it now does. And now it's just monitoring all of the resources, but you get a collective view for all of the virtual machines and which ones have got resource and forecasted events. Um, that was prototyped extremely successfully, and that led us to a natural conclusion, which System Insights can't do because it might be running on bare metal. When you're running in Azure, if a resource exhaustion forecasting event is predicted that you're going to run out of disk space, that's a pretty easy one for us to predict. CPU is harder to predict. Memory, that's a good one for us to predict because it has a significant impact. We all know that they've got this much memory, and today we've got gobs of it. But when we use too much memory, we start paging stuff out onto the disk and now you're looking at a 10,000 fold performance degradation memory versus disk IOPS yep. or whatever that factor is. It's going to be a very, very high number in terms of how much faster memory is in disk space. It would be good for resource exhaustion forecasting to be able to predict when you're going to end up deep in the page file, which will then have an impact on the throughput of whatever the services you're monitoring. So one of the things that we are then going to do with the resource exhaustion forecasting data is feed it in to a right sizing engine where customers, and again, hypothetical, prototyped, yes, ready as a service, no idea when, but we are very much planning on building this, a right sizing engine that will say, that VM is under provisioned. You're gonna end up 90% in your page file in six weeks, at which point people should be like, ah, I'm pulling their hair out, which apparently you must have already had one of those events, Pierre, because you've clearly I, pulled it all I've out. I've had several. That, this yeah, is my absolutely. COVID haircut. <laughs> so that will feed into a policy-driven right-sizing engine and allow customers to say whether they don't care, uh, want to be notified, or whether we should just automatically fix it. And we would then go ahead and upsize the VM and then power it off and power it back on again within the maintenance window that's been configured for that VM, assuming one exists. And we would also do the same for cost optimization. If it said that the VM was over-provisioned and the CPU was sat there at 14% in the past six months straight and less, we're like, you, you over-provisioned this, get a cheaper one. And then they'd be able to define a policy that says, do we just automatically downsize it and get a cheaper VM? So it's not just for performance optimization, it's also for cost optimization. Again, those two features, we call them resource exhaustion forecasting and automated VM right-sizing, very much part of the imminent roadmap. 
Today is the day prior to uh, April Fool's Day 2021. I don't know what imminent means on those time frames because we're biasing patch orchestration. If somebody doubles my dev team, literally doubles it inside, then I can do both at the same time. But yeah, time frames for those are not yet known. Um, the other stuff is more icing on the cake features. Automatic ASR, for example, ASR being uh, Azure Site Recovery. recovery. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we may automatically figure out based on patch orchestration application definitions. So we use the data that I was mentioning to you earlier on that will allow you to model the entire end tier app. We might use that same model for ASR purposes and then automatically create you a DR plan and then automatically test the DR plan in a sandbox to see that this stuff works. Those sort of things are the uh, the way that we're thinking in the VM vertical. And then obviously more laterally, we've got stuff like, should we auto manage AKS and other such services that are high value, but deemed to be complex. Okay, so there. Uh, what about the some PaaS services such as like uh, 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 Azure SQL, like making so, sure that the, the backups are there, that the, the encryption is set and all stuff, uh, all of those services. I uh, Just so you know, folks, I didn't actually tee up Pierre with that question, but uh, it's a perfect one. We are currently prototyping under the Auto Manage VM Best Practices banner, something called workload optimizations, which means we know that there's an OS there and we know that there's a VM because you're auto managing it. So, so far, VM best practices really just goes up to the OS layer in the stack. Yeah. But then we know that there are workloads atop that, like SQL, and then applications that are using those workloads on the operating system on the VM. So there's your overall stack. We want to push ourselves one layer up further in the stack into those workloads. The one that we've prototyped thus far is da -da 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 -da, SQL. So uh, we, believe it or not, exactly. And uh, I'm, I promise you, folks, I didn't even tee that up with Pierre. That was just us. Pure out of the blue and a good question to ask. So they actually already have uh, an Azure SQL offering for virtual machines. They literally call it SQL VM. Yeah. It's not particularly descriptive in that it distinguishes itself from uh, the phrase SQL VM when I'm just talking about a VM that happens to be running SQL. That is actually the brand because they have two other areas where they have similar branding. Uh, we've prototyped that with them. We would consider that to be a workload optimization. And if you said this machine is going to be SQL or we detected it was SQL, we can then automatically start putting in place the best practices, not only specific to the OS, but specific to the database, where instead of backing up a SQL database as part of a disk that you're backing up, it actually knows it's a SQL database and backs it up using SQL semantics as opposed to OS file system semantics. So yes, we are already looking at doing that as well. That's wonderful. Well, Dean, uh... It's been 42 minutes. Uh, I'm very, very happy to have had those conversations with you. Uh, okay. And I am super happy that you were uh, candid and told us what uh, is coming up because uh, everything you've said, uh, I know will resonate very, very uh, heavily with our audience, which is uh, IT pros, operations, uh, and, and, and uh, architects. Great. So I'd like to thank you very much for uh, this time that you spent with us. Uh, I will put uh, at the bottom here the links that we've mentioned and also a link to the original uh, video that you've got uh, on YouTube from the original announcement that includes a, uh, a demo of the onboarding. Uh, I kind of didn't go there because I, as the discussion was going, it was so it was so good that I didn't think we should... Uh, interrupt it for a demo of how to onboard. Yeah, there's lots like of that things. already out there, Pierre. If, if you just literally go onto YouTube and search on me, I think you'll probably find my car channel with an M8 or something like that. But uh, there'll be lots of content as well uh, around auto manage, and you should be able to find the demo stuff from Ignite as well. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dean, for spending the time with us. And you uh, at home watching this, thank you very much. And as Dean mentioned, uh, in the description below, there will be some uh, links as to where you can get more information, uh, where you can provide some feedback. Uh, I will include Dean's uh, email address because he volunteered it uh, in this video, not because I want him to get spammed. Microsoft.com, baby. <laughs> He's the man. All right. So thank you very much and thank have you. a great Bye, day. Bye, guys.